it's really changed. Because I'm the chief of police here. Or members of the Eli Whitney Trades. I've been at an honest mob in my back. For YTV. For YTV. For YTV. For YTV. This is Your Yale Week. Hello and welcome to Your Yale Week. I'm Wayne Zhang and here are your top stories. Yale Law School students announced Monday that they filed a lawsuit against the state of Connecticut challenging the legality of the fall 2014 quarantine of 13 individuals, including two Yale School of Public Health students who had returned to the state from an Ebola-affected country. The suit was filed against Governor Donnell Malloy, amongst other officials, by plaintiffs, including former Yale Public Health student Ryan Boyko and current student Laura Scripp. The suit alleges that the governor acted illegally by ordering the quarantine of individuals returning from West Africa to Connecticut, including those who did not show symptoms of Ebola. This action came against the guidelines from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which advised states to quarantine only individuals who displayed symptoms of Ebola. On Wednesday, New Haven Special Victims Unit arrested Kirvana Jones, a New Haven public schools teacher for second degree sexual assault and risk of injury to a minor. The investigation leading to this arrest began last week when New Haven Police Department received allegations of unprofessional conduct between a teacher and student. The allegations were brought to light by a student of the Engineering and Science University Magnet School. Jones's bond was set at $75,000. Finally, our top story. While President Salve has said his cabinet played an active role in developing November's policies toward a better Yale, most of its members felt excluded and some expressed frustration with the process as Salve turned toward an inner circle of university leaders while in crisis. We'll return back to the story in an interview with Beat reporter David Scheimer. But first, for a quick look at next week, Claire Liu. Thanks, Wayne. Cheer on the Bulldogs this weekend, starting with women's basketball at 7, as they face Dartmouth in Payne Whitney. And be sure to catch them again Saturday at 7 p.m. against Harvard. Earlier on Saturday at 4 p.m., the women's ice hockey team will take on Cornell at Ingalls Rink for their senior day. And finally, gymnastics will be hosting their senior day on Saturday against Westchester and Rhode Island College. There are some great art events going up this Valentine's Day weekend. In the Eisman Theater, a production of the Shakespearean classic The Merchant of Venice, directed by Kevin Hurrigan, will be going up at 8 p.m. Friday and 4 p.m. Saturday. At 8.30 p.m. on Friday, Shades will be presenting their Valentine's Day show in SSS with all the R&B love ballads and silky smooth a cappella voices anyone could ask for. And on Saturday at 8 p.m., the Yale Symphony Orchestra will be presenting their 50th anniversary show with former conductor and Grammy Award winner John Masseri. Finally, don't forget to pick up your copy of Weekend. This week's cover story compares and contrasts the protests to rename Calhoun College with the Roads Must Fall movement, the call to remove a statue of Cecil Rhodes in Cape Town, South Africa. Back to you, Wayne. Thanks, Claire. I'm joined by David Scheimer, a beat reporter for Woodbridge Hall, about tonight's top story. Thank you for being with us, David. Oh, no worries. It's my pleasure. So, could you begin by explaining how the cabinet works a little bit? Sure. So, I think the cabinet actually is something people aren't as familiar with as things like the Yale Corporation. The cabinet is really, it is a formal body established by President oh. Salve when he, uh, when he took over Yale in 2013. And it's composed of the professional school deans, the university vice presidents, the provost, President Salve. In that role, its original charge is basically to look over university policy as well as its kind of global goals and its trajectory as well as to just meet every month check in and make sure deans and vice presidents are really on the same page so what did you find about the involvement of the larger cabinet in decision making during last november's crisis so i think november was really unique because it was the first time the cabinet was thrown into crisis when there was something going on on in the university that was fast moving the president had to make decisions in a short amount of time and the question became how what role would the cabinet play in that and the answer is that it really didn't play much of a role at all the president met with the cabinet once in person and he had a phone call with the cabinet during that two and a half week period where the policies were in development but those were more briefings they weren't to talk about actual substantive initiatives and how those were going to be developed so a number of deans well most professional school deans and several vice presidents said they were not included in the development of initiatives and a smaller group of those individuals were upset about not being included because they thought the policies that president salve was developing um had 
implications across the entire university, not just Yale College. So if not the cabinet at large, who's making decisions then? There was a core group of individuals, um, and I've been told that the reason they were given jurisdiction or they were given the opportunity to really dive into policy development was because of the areas over which they have jurisdiction. Take, for example, Jonathan Holloway, the dean of Yale College, where these controversies emerged initially. He was in that group. Kim Goff Cruz, student life. The provost, head of all sorts of budget and endowment sorts of stuff. Um, they were the people, and they had several meetings with President Salovey, extended meetings where they really talked about this. Also included in those meetings were President Salovey's senior advisor, Martha Highsmith, and Chief of Staff, Joy McGrath. And their roles, I've been told, are a little bit more fuzzy. People aren't sure whether they're decision makers or whether they're more about expediting process, but they were there. So given all of this, what can you say about the utility of the cabinet during war time sensitive situations? So I think that some people have called into question whether it's even possible to have a body with 30 university leaders meet and then make decisions in a short amount of time. I mean, I think if there were an unlimited scope or an unlimited span um, where they could debate, then its utility would increase. But in two and a half weeks, it's not really that feasible, especially, and a point I think a lot of people don't think about is that these deans and vice presidents are always traveling. And a lot of people told me I physically couldn't even get to the meeting. So in terms of calling these 30 people in out of the blue to really make substantive decisions, it's just in a lot of ways not in the cards. So I think that President Salve has told me that he would in the future solicit more opportunity and more input. He would give them more opportunities to provide feedback. He would try to get them a draft sooner. And I think that a lot of deans have said that they really do need to think about whether there is an alternative form of communication that they could, that the president's office could utilize outside of the cabinet that would give them an opportunity to really um, join in on the conversation without making it more inefficient. All right. Thank you so much for being with us, David. On behalf of everyone at YTV, have a wonderful weekend.